Bam. This is Rich Lede, and you are watching and listening to the Break It Down show. I told you to say handsome, Rich Lede. I know, I know, but I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Take that microphone of yours and tilt it a little bit away from your mouth. It's a little it's, bit too hot. Too hot. That, that that's better? fine. Yeah, that's a little better. Hey, man, uh, you and I, let's do a little bit of bona fides because folks don't know and folks who don't know don't know. And we got to give them an idea. We're going to talk about the state. We're going to talk about corruption and shadow governments. And we're going to apply some of what we did in Afghanistan to what is probably coming down the pipe in Ukraine. And I'm going to say this part initially up front. Uh, Ukraine is not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's not the middle of somewhere Africa. However, we are the same tool. We're the same bludgeon. We're the same toolkit. So let's talk a little bit about why you and I specifically have authority to talk about corruption and reconstruction and all these different tools in the American toolbox. You want me to go first? The yeah. audience knows you more than me. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a Ukraine expert, nor am I um, an expert on the post-Soviet life, life in the post-Soviet states. Um, but I do understand not just from an academic perspective, but also practically speaking, I do understand and know what you mean when you say we are the same tool. Because the same United States government that sent you and I to war zones to do work um, will be and is actively engaged in uh, supporting the Ukrainian people right now, uh, militarily. And, you know, once this stuff clears out, and hopefully the violence ceases soon, um, we're going to be involved in reconstruction in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I don't think our government's just going to be doing government work. I know our country's probably waiting for things to be, to be a bit calmer so we can help promote business and the business environment and get that get that off the ground, particularly uh, energy and f agricultural production is, is what, is what Ukraine, well, the rest of the world wants things to be calm so they can engage in economic activity with, uh, with Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian businesses, the government and, and, and the people, the, the civil society. Right. Um, so I mentioned that, I had an academic understanding of some of this stuff. I'm trained as an American comparativist by, uh, by trade, but um, I've written, in addition to writing um, three peer reviewed papers, two of which um, you you helped out with in a, in a book chapter, uh, your names are on there too. I've, I've have two peer reviewed publications specifically on corruption, political corruption. But I looked at the United States and I did, I treated the states as units of analysis. So that's, um, that's a bit of what I know. And if anyone in the audience wants to reach out, if you can't, if you, you can go on Google Scholar and find out who I am and see everything I've published. But if you'd like uh, some direct links to article because of a paywall or something, just send me an email, let me know. So I've got academic experience on the subject, but I've also got some practical knowledge, particularly working with you in Afghanistan, uh, in addition to being an ex-infantry soldier myself. So I've got some familiarity with the DOD and working in a bureaucratic capacity for the United States government. That, that was long-winded, but mm -hmm. to the point. That's all right. I'm going to show you a, an image because one of the things, look, when you've done this work as long as I have, and then I bring someone like you who's got the academic experience, there's tells. And these are things where as soon as I hear someone with American talk about things, I'm like, oh, there's a problem, <laughs> right? And so I'm just going to show you an image because these images are often tells. And there was a thing in the Baghdad province out in the country, that's the farmlands. And you, you hear and see these things and you go, oh, there's a problem. Right, so I'm going to put this image on the screen, and Rich, you're instantly going to see the problem here. Here, here we go. Okay, so there's a thing called the Green Medine, and the key word here is co-op. All right, so we're going to have a co-op out in the farmlands of, of Baghdad province. Ready? Here, here's the image, everybody. Bam. So, anytime you see 
the white arm <laughs> embracing the brown man or the brown hand right and then you see greenhouses tractors seedlings and all of these things to work to help the iraqi farmer Rich. Well, <laughs> yeah i'm i'm just wondering if the iraqi farmer needed help in the first place what my first of course <laughs> my, he's my first yeah. what i first what my first uh reaction um but at least he tried to get his his shirt to kind of you know the maybe match the Iraqi farmer's hat, you know. Like it's like a, <laughs> a similar pattern. I don't, I'm colorblind, so I see a similar pattern though. Yeah. So he's trying with the plaid, I guess, farmer plaid. Yeah, it was like a plaid and a hound's tooth check. You're right. There's a crazy pattern thing. But yeah, so you have this co-op idea, right? And we're always trying to create these things, these ideas, these concepts that I always say, this briefs well, right? Why don't we help the Iraqis be more efficient farmers? Why don't we help the Afghans grow grapes better? Why don't we help the Ukrainians have modern farming techniques? But we go out there and I swear to God, if you type in, in any kind of AI chat thing and you say, what is the green medine? You will see a positive or when anybody do this, go to your, your, your standard uh, AI thing and type in, what is the green Madonna? And I'll type this in here so you guys can all, all, all do this test yourself. What is the gr green Madonna? And when you type this into your search, you'll get a positive result. The green Madonna does not exist. It didn't exist when it was there, right? So what, and I'm going to just give you this anecdote and then I'm going to shut up and let Rich do his work. So here's what would happen. The State Department would say, hey, a Canadian Iraqi guy who wears a snazzy suit, shiny, speaks English. Uh, we're going to come out. You're going to show us the green Medina. That's great work it's doing. And so he would bring in the pretty girls from Iraq, the city girls. They would put on their beautiful hijabs and they would put out this fantastic spread and they would talk about all the great things that the farmers were doing with the co-op. I worked in this area and you know what I would do? I would go to the Green Medine before the meeting when there'd be nobody there. I would talk to the farmers in the fields before this meeting. And then we'd have the meeting and I'd eat the delicious chicken and all the chuba and all the things that were there. And I would listen to the <laughs> bullshit show. And then you know what I would do after that meeting, Rich? I'd go back out and I would repeat the process. And I would say before, during, after, here's what happened. And there was no co-oping of anything. It was all briefable as working. And it became the darling of the State Department for the reason. Yeah. Look at what we're doing, right? And it was all bullshit. I, I have a, a picture of me on one of my old phones where I'm holding as many stacks of hundreds as I can put in my big hands. And that wasn't all the money we were going to hand over that day. Mm -hmm. And so that is corruption. It's lies to ourselves. None of it ever worked. But if you look at the historic record, if you go ask that chat AI bot what the Green Medina is, it is alive. It is sustainable. And it was about, and it was never, ever, ever there. Never. Yeah, isn't it? Wasn't it supposed to be? And this is this is Wikipedia. Wasn't it supposed to be a not-for-profit agricultural cooperative? Yeah. Yeah. So what were the stacks of hundreds for? <laughs> now I mean, click on click on any of the reference links. They're all yeah. dead. Oh no, I see. Uh, I see somebody, uh, a book written about it, We Meant Well, How I Helped Lose the Battle for Iraqi Hearts and Minds by former PRT team leader, Peter Van Buren. Peter Van heard, Buren's a buddy of mine. I heard, yeah. that, guy, heard that guy before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. yeah. Well, this is, I mean, this is, again, another example of it briefs well. And, you know, the people we always, you and I always reference the spaceship, the spaceships up there. I mean, here in academic world, I, I call it theory land. There's philosophy. There's the way the world should be. And then the way the world is. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even going back to, to Afghanistan, one of the reasons why I think you and I worked well together is because we're interested in that gap between theory and practice, between the spaceship and what's happening boots on the ground essentially and you know that phrase boots on the ground that's a i think i think we've got that in two peer-reviewed papers in the title because it 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 means something right what do you see what is the empirical reality that you see you know and i mean thinking about the united states trying to i'm using my air quote improve agricultural production um that that to me is laughable 
uh, and its face value. I mean, even before deploying to Afghanistan, because people have been farming in this part of the world long before we ever invented tractors, long before we ever invented modern fertilizers, long before modern day economic systems were even developed. So if we're trying to I'm, I'm inclined to say if we're trying to improve anything, we're trying to improve it for our benefit. That's that's what I'm going to look at first. And maybe we want to increase the yield of a crop so the farmers there can sell more of the crop and make more money. But, um, you know, even the idea of making more money doesn't doesn't always translate well, you know, and, and some in particular. I mean, I didn't I didn't deploy to uh, to Iraq, but I could save at least in the Afghan case, a lot of farmers I talked to didn't, they, they wanted to feed themselves and their family and provide for their, you know, people, pe their extended family and people in their village. The idea of making money, you know, wasn't really, yeah, everybody likes money, but that's not their primary concern. So even introducing some of our market values into their market systems, I would say is, is in itself a form of, a form of corruption. You know, because we're corrupting a system. Yeah. You know? One of the conversations I had before you had got to our part of Afghanistan was with a major from the army, and he was part of the the ag team. And you know, I'm pretty rough on these ag teams, but I promise yeah, these guys can reason. take it for good reason. They can take it, uh, and they wanted to. And I don't want to get too lost on the ag side of things, but we are illustrating this gap that you're talking about between theory land, the spaceship, mm -hmm. uh, the policy land the state department and then the ground right and uh, this guy was talking about pomegranates and and you know all of these things agricultural farms female farmings um you know these all all of these tools to help these these farmers and i said what's the market chain like what how have these farmers in this valley performed can you describe it and he's like no and then my obvious response and question is, is why are you fucking with it? <laughs> if you don't, and I literally said that, like, why are you fucking with it? Like, if you don't know what the market chain is, who, who's buying these pomegranates? Like what person is actually going to pay money and put this pomegranate into their mouth? Is that person in India? Are they in Pakistan? Are they in say, Seattle? Mm -hmm. If you don't know, and this is where this whole phrase come from, like, you cannot presume to improve the condition of something that you refuse to understand the condition of, right? And that's, this is all goes to corruption. And, and yeah. yes, we're talking about little micro slivers of it, but if you cannot stop that bleeding of corruption into your system, everybody understands that any help that you give is there for the taking and they should do whatever they want with it because no one cares about them. And so they should just take whatever is available and use it however they want because we have completely corrupted the system. I'm shutting up the PhD yeah. talk. Well, I don't. I don't want to veer. I mean, a couple of things came to mind as you were saying that, and I mean, one thing was, of course, the <laughs> the collection centers that you and I have spent a lot of time looking at, sitting under for shade, you know, waiting for a ride. Collection centers in Afghanistan, you know, a, a nice tin concrete and tin metal shack that we're, you know, we're supposed to, all the Afghan farmers are going to have this central location where they bring their crops to so that the vendors can come and, and view the crops and decide what they want to purchase. Yeah. And that was, again, like just not understanding the system to begin with, because, you know, in the place where you and I work together, that's just not how agriculture had ever been done. In addition to the fact that we're asking farmers to put their produce under a hot metal you know, in a hot metal structure, for one thing, um, that totally, I would go back to, you know, say corrupted the system, because that's not how agricultural mm. production moved from the farmer to the vendor. The vendor wanted to see the plot of land where the produce was, was, was grown, you know, mm. and that w was also part of relationships between the buyers and the sellers. I mean, not, you know, not the individual person going to buy a pomegranate, but the, the big business coming in saying, we've got a relationship with you going back generations. I've seen these pomegranates trees since they were seedlings. And I want to buy this plot, this whole row of trees. You know, we had very little understanding of that. If we did understand it, we certainly didn't implement that into our operations, you know? So, having boots on the ground to 
make that observation about how the economic system, how the market works in the first place is valuable, but you also have to get that knowledge to the top and it's got to be received though at the top. But, you know, and by the top, I mean the spaceship we're talking about, um, you know, because in policy world, there's there's often a tendency to overlook this kind of on the ground knowledge. And, and we see it in, in many, many of our different development efforts that we engaged in in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we will probably make some of the same mistakes in Ukraine once the conflict once the conflict kind of diminishes to the point where we, you know, we can operate a bit more safely, we're going to make some of the same mistakes because we're going to lose track of that local knowledge. We're going to lose track of what actually, and I'll use the word culture, what kind of culture has developed around, you know, whatever this thing is that we're working on, you know? So, you know, and the other thing I was thinking about, again, I don't want to get too far off base here was, you know, I'm, I'm constantly brought back to thinking about uh, you and I wrote a paper um, with my life partner, Sharon. We wrote that paper on the female engagement teams. And when you were just talking about how, you know, we, we just fundamentally didn't understand that thing that we were trying to change. We had really surface level knowledge by we, I mean, the Department of Defense and to a great extent, the Department of State. We only had surface level knowledge of you know, the lives of women in Afghanistan. Now that surface level knowledge told us enough that women are worse than second class citizens in society. Taliban treats them harshly. And if you pay paying attention to Afghanistan today, it's only, it's, it's, I would argue that it's gotten worse since we left than it was before we've gotten in there. And in particular, because our information is much more limited now than when it was before. Right. But People at the State Department, people at the Department of Defense, the policymaking level, that spaceship, they didn't have the boots on the ground knowledge. And again, if they had it, they overlooked it, they avoided it, and they didn't implement it. Because, you know, there have been authors that have engaged in ethnography in that part of the world and have taught us a lot about what it means to be a woman in a Muslim culture, specifically in Afghan culture, you know, uh, in, amongst Pashtun people, there's not a lot of it, but it's there and it's recognizable. But I think what happens is, you know, the people at the top, the policymakers in that whole policymaking, you know, that whole policymaking process is often prone to overlooking things and i'm not all i'm not saying it's always malicious but sometimes it is you know ignorance doesn't have to ignorance itself is not bad but once you know mm. something and then you choose to remain ignorant about for example what's really going on in that village cluster with the women in that in that compound not accepting that reality and not implementing it into your planning procedures that in itself i think is a form of corruption you know, because yeah. it's a form, it's, it's, it's dishonest. It's unethical, you know, a willful ignorance and remaining ignorant, I think is, I will go so far as to say that that is an ethical challenge in itself, you know, but in this case, it's not necessarily being always being done for personal gain, which is what the, you know, the more traditional definitions of corruption tend to involve it's you know using your office or your position of power for private gain um you know what we're doing and specifically i mean going back to the female engagement um oper female engagement issue um yeah we have this noble pursuit we're going to make the lives of women better and more comfortable we're going to empower women but we fundamentally don't understand or don't acknowledge that we understand really what it means culturally to be a woman, you know, yeah. uh, in, in Afghanistan. And I, I know you've seen some of this in Iraq as well, you know, and again, I, I don't want to stay too yeah. much on the, the female. Let, let me, let me grab us and, and pull us back towards the root because, you know, we've established this, uh, this ground reality that we, we struggle to communicate vertically um, well. And when, when the feedback loop is negative, it's uh, if it even gets to the top where it might be fixed, it's usually rejected that reality. So we know that there's a problem there and that that corrupts the um, 
information and the ideas coming down. It's like, wait, hold on a second. What do you mean co-ops don't work? Mm -hmm. And so that corrupts internally the ability to, and maybe I'm using corruption in the wrong way, but that does, it influences the ability of the machine, the policy machine to choose wisely, right? Because yeah. it's incorruptible. Yeah. And so it will not change. Well, I don't think so they're using that yeah. word the wrong way though. You know, and that that yeah. was kind of my point with kind of hammering on the the female engagement team and the collection centers was because corruption, you know, you have to define. Yeah, I'm a political scientist and you cannot sit in my classroom and hand in a paper without defining your terms. Like, What do yeah. you mean? And corruption is one of those terms that in my discipline, it's not difficult to define, but to have an acceptable definition. Yeah. It's going to be acceptable across, you know, the, the range of scholars. So we have to be very specific, you know, in my research papers, I had to, here's my, this is my definition of corruption because I have to define it before I can mm. go observe it, you know? So that's why I kind of, I mean, I make a distinction between, you know, you can corrupt a process, right? Right. So, so it's, it's really getting to the point that this term that we're talking about, Right. It's you have to define it and it can mean different things, not just to different entities, different individuals, but across cultures. You know, it's going to mean something different to different people. Right. Yeah. And even within that, there's a lot of things to say. And I, we should add an, a new term here is corrupting force. And the U.S. has yeah. a tendency to be a corrupting force. And so when when you look at a place like Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq, these are all places that know how to farm. and could we possibly improve that system? Yes. Well, okay. What does farming look like today? What do they accept as possible? What might we do to slightly improve that? What external measure might we apply to ensure that that slight improvement is happening? I mean, like this is a very systematic approach. Yeah. And yeah. can we accept failure when this doesn't work? Because chances are, uh, it might not work. And when you go to a place like Afghanistan where security is the one, two, three, and fourth priority of any operation, and you don't see your desired result because Pete and Rich say so, okay, well, Pete and Rich aren't here to lie to us. Um, why is this not working? Well, that's because the Taliban are saying, hey, knock that shit off. You know, like I can't grow more crops and have more money because that's going to put me on front street and front streets where you get killed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't just get you killed. It gets your it gets your eldest son kidnapped, and now yeah. he's now he's fighting for the Taliban. Now, now he's you know? he's two finger mo, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It gets your so, it, it gets your youngest daughter sold into slavery. You know, it, right. it gets it gets one of your kids marching into an open market with a suicide vest strapped on him. You and know? you might say, well, those are examples for Afghanistan. We could do this for any yeah. society. So if you're in an unstable Ukraine and there's not enough to go around and there's competition intra competition between farmers look out yeah you know yeah exactly because who's going to patrol that yeah well and you also like the corrupting force in this case could be the overt western influence that decides to pick one farm over another you know no. because we might be looking at a map saying oh this farm looks like it has better access to water and irrigation. Mm -hmm. So let's focus our efforts here. Well, mm -hmm. you might have just elevated the town crook, you yeah. know, for all for yeah. all we know, you know. But that goes back to without having that, like you need some baseline knowledge. You need some boots on the ground knowledge, but you need some mm -hmm. baseline knowledge of the environment that you're working in because you also need to be able to assess whether you've improved or not, you know, and even I, I would argue even the collection of that baseline knowledge is can be corrupted. You know, yeah. so and this is, you know, I, I don't this isn't a conversation about bias, but we always introduce bias into our definitions, into our yeah. observations. So this is why it's helpful to have, you know, different sets of eyes on the problem, you know, but also those sets of eyeballs on the problem need to have, need to have that open mind to be able to say, we might get this wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to implement that into not just our planning processes, but when it's time to, you know, when we're at the end of that four step equation or we're at whatever it is, and it's time for us to reflect, we have got to, be honest 
with ourselves and the progress right. we've made or the damage that we've done, you know, or, you know, accepting ourselves as potentially be, you know, accepting our processes and our planning as also potentially a corrupting force, I think would be that that should be in stage zero of the planning process. That should be. And, and you're being kind. I would say I'm, take I'm out the adverb. Kind. Yeah, I take out the adverb and say we are a corrupting force. Yeah. We are a net destabilizer. And until well, we accept that reality, mm -hmm. we will not change it. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be kind to public institutions because I work at a public institution. <laughs> and that yeah. reminds me I need to say my uh Th these thoughts and opinions are my own. They are not yeah. thoughts and opinions of any administrator at Troy University, nor they, nor have I been compelled to say anything by anyone else. This is all me. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So with that said, and you have these organizations that have quite a bit of power, corrupting power, if I might say, the, a, a source of corrupting power, the U.S. government, State Department, U.S. Ag, all these different organizations, and I'm not look. I'm not saying there's any nefarious intent here, but there's a lot of influence, and it might come from the center of government power and be pushed out without any kind of uh, accompanying messaging or checking system, as we saw um, in our time. Like, hey, look, here's a message coming out from Kalat, boom, and it goes and it goes out into the valleys and it disappears at whatever, and no one goes to look and see did it work. So you have you have that that node that shoots out a message and may or may not ever get checked or looked upon, but it is briefed as as working. And <laughs> and then they're like, "Hey, there's a shadow government going on," yeah. and so they send someone like Rich out to go discover what the shadow government is. And oftentimes, the shadow government is a surprising thing. So we look for the shadow government. And we look at it from a point of view of threat, typically, because it is undermining the government that we want. By the way, hint, hint, the government that we put in place is also a form of a shadow government. So let's talk about shadow governments, because what exists right now currently in Ukraine and what will exist in a stable Ukraine, they're different things, right? Well, I mean... Uh... War is going to change, you know, war, war will change the state, you know, the state makes war, but war also makes the state. So there's going to, there's going to be some adjustments, I'm sure, within the Ukrainian government. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. Uh, I do know that since the fall of the Soviet Union, though, Ukraine was one of those countries that was probably, you know, international organizations might score different countries on corruption metrics. I know Ukraine was one of those countries that had big problems with corruption, but corruption that we knew about, right? Because here's the thing about corruption and, you know, going back to some of my work in the American states, um, the best corruption, one thing that makes corruption hard to study is because if it's done right, you can't see it. If yeah. it's done right, you'll never know about it, right? And if, if, if you know, the definition of corruption I've used in my work uh, is very specific to public officials using their office for private gain, right? Now that's, you could extend that to not just, is a public official a bureaucrat who is unelected? I say yes. Some scholars may say no, right? They may only want to focus their research or aspects of their research on elected officials, for example. Elected officials are bribed by companies all the time, right? Except we don't call them bribes. We call them campaign contributions. And, you know, we don't, it may not be a, you know, you know, um, a, a corrupt businessman. We might call it an interest group. Right. But these are all things that if you kind of look at these, even looking at the American political system in more abstract terms, you know, I argue that the interest group system itself is just like legalized corruption, you know, mm -hmm. because it allows undue corporate influence into our politics. And I'm still not convinced that corporations are always looking out for me and my family. They're looking out for profits. That's why corporations exist. Right. right. So, you know, but looking at going back to my definition of public officials using their office for private gain. Right. 
you got a lot of kickbacks. You got a lot of, you know, his, his a form of corruption. I like, I think goes understudied is nepotism, you know, people's kids getting sweet jobs in the companies because their parents are political figures. Right. So I, I think that's a corrupting influence. Nepotism is a corrupting influence in our democratic political system. But, you know, I've, I often, want to be harsh on our political system. Now, Ukraine's going to have to figure this out for themselves, right? But they've got a history of experiencing, but corruption that we know, that we know mm. about. Now, also my, you know, surface level review of Ukraine's recent history, they have taken steps with the help of the international community to try to deal with their corruption problem to try to not just deal with the corruption you can see, but address perceptions of corruption. Cause mm -hmm. see, and that's, that's one thing I had in my notes before we, before we started this, cause I wanted to, and, and I don't, again, I don't want to steer too far from your main point, but see, there's corruption that exists yep. that we can see. There's corruption that exists that we can't see. Right. Yes. But there's also objective corruption, right? How many people in your state were convicted of a crime that is bribery, right? That is an objective measure of corruption. In fact, that's the measure that I used in some of my work, right? How many people are sitting in jail right now for corruption? Well, wow. that's the corruption we know about. That's the corruption that the Department of Justice went after and found, prosecuted. And you know what? The Department of Justice has a really, really high conviction rate. When they decide to go after your ass, you're damn near almost always done, right? But there's another type of corruption that is not objective. It is totally subjective. It might be based on people's object, uh, objective ideas of reality, but there's the perception of corruption. Yes. Now, perceived yes. corruption, I would argue, is worse Hold on to your butts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Perceptions of corruption are worse than actual corruption because you can root out and get rid of and prosecute actual corruption. If it's government, if it's corruption in civil society, you know, nonprofit organizations all the time, charities are under scrutiny all the time because is the charity I give money to? Are you using 90% of my charitable contribution for administrative purposes, I would say that's corrupt, right? Because you're doing something, you're dishonest, you're unethical, you may not be criminally charged, you might be criminally charged, but the perception of corruption. So you can mm. root, you can find and get rid of those corrupt politicians. But if people perceive their government, if people perceive corporations, if people perceive, I'll pick on the Supreme Court because they're yeah. in the news these days. I perceive that Supreme Court judges who go on fancy trips that I could never afford, I perceive that to be corrupt because those people that you're going on those fancy trips with that are paying for those fancy trips have cases in front of you. I think judges should remove, recuse themselves all the way up to the highest level. I think they should recuse themselves from any case that has to do with any of their friends. I don't care if the friend is rich or not. So see, I perceive there to be corruption. Now, here's why perceived corruption is worse than actual corruption. Change my mind. Yeah. Try yeah. to change my mind about what I just said about the Supreme Court. Try. And Let's, good luck with that. Let me grab this and bring it back to another angle for corruption. So we had um, a friend of mine, Irene, was on the show. We were talking about state takeover of certain industries and we know that there's so much competent ukraine is a wealthy place in terms of resources a lot of a lot of energy resources a lot of farming resources there's a lot of money to be made there um and people power too people power for sure right and this is a place that if left alone can really launch itself forward in a way that will be remarkable in our lifetimes and so folks are definitely think tanking writing papers, picking their bad guys, picking their horses, yep. and they're competing externally to try to build the Ukraine of the future in their interest, because it's in their interest, but also in Ukraine's interest, right? Yeah. It's an opportunity. 
It's right. a, it's a business opportunity. It's a political opportunity. Yes. It's a, it's a geopolitical opportunity too. Right. So there's, there's that there's also, um, and I guess the best way to say this is, uh, in our lifetimes, there was a USSR and then that broke. And everybody had to scramble to to become something else. And so all of these different states that have continued to fracture, Yugoslavia is a great example of a place that still hasn't healed itself. Some areas are doing better, some areas are not. If you go to your Eastern Europe, you're still going to see donkey-drawn carts. And you're like, what part of the world am I in? This looks nothing like Great Britain, right? Like it's completely different worlds. And so when you look at the former Soviet Union places and the business people that hustled their way through this, this totally new world. You know, some of these guys were selling blue jeans and subways, right? And they became something. Some of these guys were thugs and they became something. And some of these guys were thugs that became legitimate business people that took care of people. Some of these guys stayed, th it's a mess. And as you and I know, if you grew up in Taliban country, it's awfully hard yeah. to change that perception that you're not still Taliban. Like, yeah, my cousin was a Taliban guy, is a Taliban guy. Yeah, you know what? I still wear track suits because I, I am from this area. However, I am a legitimate, business, legitimate businessman. We have no idea what it is like to grow up in that community. We have no idea how to pick A from B from C and decide who is good and bad. Yeah. We're desperate to try to figure out um, who should be running these industries. We suck at picking the right person who should be doing it. We love to put the rock on top of someone's head and say, you're never getting out from under this rock, even though we have no idea. Rich, we suck at this stuff, right? Yeah. And it's highly complex. And we try to put our reality on somebody else. And that's not our business anyhow. Yeah, well, you know, even, I mean, look, the people, people in Ukraine right now, they, they didn't ask, to be, you know, for the Soviet Union to collapse. I mean, that was their state. They didn't ask for their centralized government to collapse. Well, maybe some of them wanted it, right? Yeah. They didn't ask. They didn't ask to be born into that. But here's the thing: once the Soviet Union collapses, and you no longer has that have that central governing authority, and whatever sort of political culture, and you know, separate political culture, like whatever civil society had developed under the Soviet Union. Um, that's going to be impacted once the centralized government fails. And in this case, you know, Ukraine, again, along with many of the other old Soviet uh, states, they, they have had to chart their own developmental path forward. But what, what are we looking at? 30, 30 years or so since yeah. 30, 30 plus years since the Soviet Union fell. And yeah. we're still, I know scholars in the U S there's some in my department that are still trying to figure out like, where are these new States going? You know, right. I mean, right. It, it's, it's essentially what, what would happen if the government in DC collapsed, you know, well then all of a sudden, guess what? I'm in Alabama and now I'm Alabama is my nation, you know, and you're in California, California government does things their way. You know, there might be some people that want to move out, move back in. I don't know, but it's kind of hard for us to fathom that because we live in a, we, we have more stability, but I will say this, but you know, to go back to what you were saying, you know, there's still donkey drawn carts in some places in Eastern Europe. And you're wondering, you know, why are all the tractors in Ukraine? You know, well, they took a different developmental path, you know, and their, their trajectory though, was born out of instability. Now, even the Soviet union, whatever stability they tried to impose, I mean, after the Soviet Union fell and we are able to study this stuff with, with you know, with more clear lenses, you know, because the Soviet Union was a closed, closed system. You didn't you didn't have a lot of you just didn't have a lot of information. We had a whole lot of American political scientists that were Soviet scholars that all of a sudden, well, wait a minute. What are you going to do with the Soviet Union once the Soviet Union collapses? Do you have a job? Oh, yeah. They actually had more work to do. You know, because they're the people that had the bit of knowledge we had here in the West about that system in the first place. Yeah. You know? So there has to be some understanding, though, once, you know, once you you separate Ukraine from the Soviet Union, 
what's their trajectory going to look like? It's going to be based to, to, a, to a large extent on the remnants of the old system, but what's retained by that government. And yeah. this is a country, like I said, going back the little bit that I do know about Ukraine, they were one of, they were labeled as one of the most corrupt countries again and again, but they have taken steps taken steps in the last what decade decade and a half to try to to try to make things better right and by better i mean less corrupt to try to get rid of some of the criminality that was inherent in their political and economic systems you know so i think we should if anything try to in, introduce that into the conversation mm -hmm. because this is a country that for all of its resources, for all of its wealth, this is a country that essentially had to start at the bottom and, and had to start from scratch, you know, and root out the corruption that was already that was left over from the Soviets, from the Soviet era. But you also have to deal with new corruption that's going to spring out. And yeah. I, would, I would even go so far as to say some of those corrupt acts might have just been people trying to survive some of the yeah. things we see as corruption or we label as corruption. Some of the things the international community has labeled as corruption might be a guy selling, you know, selling stolen merchandise, but he's, he had to, he's got to, to feed his family. Let you me know? take you back to Afghanistan and let's play this game, right? Because this, this is why we, this is why you and I are talking because we've seen this stuff in real life. There's a guy named Governor Zarif, the district governor, and he has ties to the Taliban. He's also the Mujahideen guy. He's also a holy man. And he's also one of the longest serving governors in this province. And one of the things was there was a wheat seed distro. Mm -hmm. And it was assumed that he would be corrupt. And if you looked at his uh, bio that we collected on him in the two shop, he was definitely tied to the Taliban. By the way, Mullah Omar lives two miles from the base camp that we we're on, right? And so this is Taliban country. And if you don't know who Mullah Omar is, let me just tell you, he is bad guy number one. He is Raiders of the Lost Archean in his ties to the Prophet Muhammad, right? Yeah. And so he started the Taliban. Yeah. And, and he wears the robe of Muhammad. Yep. It's like, da -da! <laughs> so, he's, he's the boss of boss. Yeah, he's the boss. He's got one eye. <laughs> He's like straight out of central casting for Afghan bad dude. Right? And he was he living was, down the road. Yeah. <laughs> and we couldn't do a thing to catch him. Right. And so when we say like that Zarif is tied to the Taliban, yeah, probably because this guy knows how to survive anything. But when we talk to him, we're like, hey, this guy wants to govern. And if we get out of his way, he, every time we do, he, he takes more and more of the reins and he governs in a way that makes sense. And we're not telling him what to do. And so we watched him progress. And the more we got out of his way, the more he did what he was supposed to do. And, and it was working. But you can't convince the two shop that he's not this bad person because we have self-reported bad guy, bad guy, bad. And anytime he does anything that we think we don't like, it's like, here's another bad thing. Here's another bad thing. So this informs my decision on Ukraine is that we are bad at this. And so if you have someone that's like, oh, this guy sold uh, gas to people because he had to feed his family or he had um, he had a business and he's like, hey, I'm going to go do a deal. But to do this deal, I got to go talk to Jeff, the mobster, mm -hmm. because if I don't talk to him, I don't get to do this deal and I might get myself cut out of life. Right. Yeah. And so we have all of these things where we don't understand there. And I'm going to use some of your terms here. Or you're going to correct me on this. But the civil society is like requires that you have to go accommodate certain people because they own part of the economic reality because the state does not. And so to, to work, you have to do these things that makes you look illegal, but you're really extra legal because the legal system cannot provide. And so in Afghanistan, for example, and in Iraq, the civil court handled things up to and including murder, right? That's weird to us. In Ukraine, in post-Soviet times, a lot of things are handled outside of the law because the law, the state couldn't handle that. So when we look at yeah. some of these guys who are corrupt, a lot of times, these are just people who are like, I'm making sure the kids are getting fed. I'm making sure cotton is getting to the mill where it gets processed. I'm making sure that, and then you just line all these things up and we're like, yeah, but you're an asshole. And yeah. so it's like, uh, what do you do about that, right? Yeah. And, and well, if you're the guy who's an asshole, how do you unasshole yourself? Yeah, well, see, and here's the thing is Zarif, 
had to know the Taliban or he wouldn't have been able to govern because he was governing a space that was, I mean, we had, we had bases there, but we didn't, we didn't own that place. You know, we didn't, we didn't control much. I mean, we might, we might have controlled the skies, but that we didn't control the, well, what we were supposed to do, the heart. We, we couldn't influence the hearts and minds, but Zarif could, you know, so he knew how to work within the existing system. You know, he knew what civil society looked like prior to us showing up. You know, but it's very difficult also to convince the two shop that Zarif's not the bad guy they painted him out to be, in part because they've inherited baseball cards and a dossier on Zarif that why would they think it's wrong? But also people from the two shop never went out, didn't have lunch and dinner with Zarif, didn't know Zarif's nap schedule to the extent that you were able to figure it out. You know, yeah. don't catch this guy right now because he's napping and don't mess with his nap. Right. You know, so, you know, are you and I corrupt because we brought him gifts of notepads and pencils and crayons for his children, which he just distributed to the community anyway? Is that are we corrupt now or are we work? Because I mean, is that a bribe or a gift? You know, because yeah. that's that's part of this conversation, too. You know, here's another thing. Um, am I corrupt if I'm trying to run a business and I have to like pay a gratuity to a warlord because he owns or he don't own anything, but he controls a stretch of highway that I need my trucks to move across this stretch of highway that warlord. And this, this is these these are examples from Afghanistan. There are warlords who control the space. Right. You pay them tribute to pass through their space or you're going to get blown up. In fact, you might not get blown up. Somebody else might get blown up to teach you a lesson, you know, and these are things that, you know, going back to the state, like the United, like we are a corrupting force, especially if we don't understand that, you know, but uh, we've got guidelines and policies and procedures we have to follow that don't necessarily account for that. But at the end of the day, sometimes you're walking around with big stacks of hundreds with, you know, United States legal <laughs> currency here. Like, is that itself not like, is that not, is that not a corrupting force? Is that not, is that, does that not also represent a failure to understand the operating environment? So we don't corrupt it any more than maybe it already is. You know, I think one thing with the, you know, and I'm going to try to put on my comparative scholar hat. I think mm. that, you know, the Ukrainian people already have a good idea of Western ways, if you will. They already understand capitalism. I think they've done a good job of trying to promote free markets within their own country since the Soviet Union collapsed. And they could, you know, they've made some progress in terms of representative democracy. Right. But if we are thinking and any any entity you know, the Department of State, Justice, Defense, any, you know, any businesses, any nonprofits, if you think you're just going to pick up your operations and overlap them into Ukraine, you're sadly mistaken mm. because they there's just a way of doing things. Right. Mm. Just like I gave the example, God forbid, United States federal government collapses. All of a sudden now you got the state of California the nation state of California, you got the nation state of Alabama, right? Well, things are going to get run differently in different states, you know, and things are done differently. The people in a state are different. It's one reason why, you know, federalism's worked so long, so well here in the United States, you know, to a great extent, our federal government does allow states to chart their own course, right? What does that look like in Ukraine? You know, don't yeah. just think about what that look looks like when the Soviet Union falls. Now you've got all these satellite countries that used to be governed by the Soviet Union. They they were the Soviet Union. Now they're not. Yeah. Right. But what about within Ukraine? Right. So that's another that's another level of layer of this conversation. Right. That it's not just a regional thing like there's domestic politics within Ukraine that have to be accounted for as well. And not just not being a Ukraine expert, I'm guessing that just guessing what goes on on the West is not exactly what goes on in the East. Yeah. You know? yeah. So 
You know, that comparative set of lenses, though, really, if if any entity, any governmental nonprofit business entity wants to be doing work in Ukraine, there's some historical realities you have to accept and work into your planning processes. But there's also like time now and what what has become after that history, you know, before the Soviet Union, now after the Soviet Union, how has has their development been been occurring, you know, and to what extent can we continue the developmental path after this, after the violence? Well, after the violence yeah. ends, I, I don't, I'm not convinced that it will, because yeah, well, you're, gonna have, you're probably going to have separatist groups. You're going to oh, yeah. have more Russian incursion. It, you know, give it a name, but is there going to be, are there going to be regional differences within Ukraine in terms of development, right? Yeah. Are there going to be different industries acting different ways? You know, the agricultural industry may not function the same way that the energy industry functions, you know, uh, the, the mining industry, you know, the material production industry, there might be, you know, and again, I've, totally got my comparative political science hat on like where where what what domains of human existence will we be able to find similarities and differences right so it's just like there are so many layers of complexity (laughs) but like long term but all like longitudinally speaking but also like you know the depth and the different levels of like industry and you know government government and governing yeah you see one of the confounding things about this is a lot of these folks know each other, yeah. you know, um, all the guys who run all the big industries who are 50 something to 65 something years old, you know who they all know? Putin. <laughs> they all know, know Putin. Of course and these do. guys, you, you know, so when the fighting does stop, and we'll set separatists aside, we'll separate them out for a minute because that is going to be a really challenging problem. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but we'll let that problem be taken care of in another episode. Um, Russia and Europe are going to have to do business. Turkey is going to have to do business with Russia, Ukraine. All of these guys are all interconnected. We're going to have some people. African uh, countries. It's, it's, it's all going to interconnect and they're going to have to cooperate. And there are existing business deals. And so if, if the state of Ukraine, I mentioned Irene earlier, and she said, she, she, she bit her tongue. She said, some of these industries are going to have to be taken over by the state. And she's like, and I'm a capitalist. I hate to say it. Mm-hmm. And then I, stepped on that and i go ah, and it may be even less comfortable to say that because she's like there's just there's no other way to do it and it's a poison pill we'll have to swallow and then how do you unstatify and then the person who's like hey you ripped me off you have to compensate that person or not yeah. and then you have all of these problems and it's like that do you turn do you twist that knob and get this gigantic cascading problem set that turns and turns into separatism. So you have all of these things. Everybody knows Putin. All of these relationships <laughs> that we can't possibly fathom because they all know each other. They've known each other for decades. All of these people that have worked together, there's trust that you can or cannot deal with. All of that stuff. I want to add another wrinkle into this too. You and I fall in on Zarif. I have been doing this kind of work for years and years and years. And I, I know how to build trust with a warlord, with a, a guy like Zarif. It's very delicate, slow work. It's not, not something I can, I'm good at it. And even I like, don't, doesn't always work. Right. And a lot of times when I fail, it's with an American. Like they're like, nope, I can remember the Air Force major who hated us. Right. And so if I don't get there, I'll say this, you don't end up having a relationship with Zarif, right? Because I had to yeah. convince the team to leave me alone because I knew how to talk to commanders. And the commander said to me, go out there and help me figure this out. And that was Jeff, Jeff Stewart. And I'll probably have him on the show to talk about this as well. So if not me, no one ever knows that Zarif is a good guy for that short window of time. And we started to repair his image and then we left. And I bet if we go back to Afghanistan, the first thing they do is they look at it and he's a bad guy again, right? So it's temporary. Will Hardy, another guy. He's with the Marines. He knows the Marines. He is a Marine. And they're like, I am itching to kill somebody. We're going to pick someone. We're going to we're gonna go out and kill someone. And so they pick a guy. He calls this guy Aga John. It just means a man in, in, uh, in Pashto or whatever, or Urdu, whatever the language they speak in that part of Afghanistan. Aga John is just a man, but he's an actual guy. And Will says, you know what? Let me look into this guy. Let's make, let's make sure we're getting the right guy. And because he had worked previously as a Marine with this Marine who was in charge of targeting, that guy goes, okay, Will, 
I'll give you two weeks. And Will came back and said, not only should you not kill this guy, he's about to be part of Jeroa, the legitimate at the time <laughs> government of, of Afghanistan. And he is in charge of displaced people. Yeah. So um, the guy that the Marines would have 99 times out of 100, they would have twisted this guy's cap. They would have killed him most yeah. of the time, if not for Will being there. That is how likely we are, at least in the case of Afghanistan. And I would say, and in the case of Iraq, to go out and just go kill someone, right? Now, I'm not saying we're, out, we're going to be lethal like that in Ukraine. I'm not saying that we're not. When we find a bad guy, we don't let him not be a bad guy. And yeah. if that guy's desperate to be a good guy, we don't, it's really tough to get out of that thing. So, Again, this sorting process of someone who's worked extra state, and I'm not saying illegally, I'm saying outside of the state, even if they want to be a good guy, if someone is hell bent on them being bad, I don't know how you reliably recover that person unless you have an agent like a Pete, like yeah. a Will, like a Rich. Yeah, well, because we can, it's not just speaking truth to power, but it's making the observations that can then get turned into data that can be analyzed to say, look, this is not a bad guy, or I should say is not as bad as you're making him out to be. Right. Because look for Zarif to govern for Zarif to do the physical act of governing. He had to know the Taliban. He knew the Taliban's ways. And by the way, for him to govern also meant he was keeping people in his community alive. Right. He was preventing, he was working in a way that prevented bombs, that prevented bullets, you know. So, of course, he's, is he Taliban? Is he a Taliban sympathizer? Or maybe he just understands his people, you know, and he understands what's needed to govern. Right. And what the area of Afghanistan we're talking about is one of the most rural areas, not just in Afghanistan, but on the planet. It is yeah. not easy to govern. It's not easy to walk around there, you know. <laughs> but yet there are people that are living there longer than our country has been a country, yeah. and they they're just waiting for us to leave. Of course, he knows the Taliban, right? Of course, yeah. he probably has lunch with them, you know. But here's the other thing: in Ukraine, if you wanted to do business, I'm sure everybody had to know Putin. You know, Putin is by most many accounts probably the most wealthy person in the world because we don't even know how much he owns or controls right. you know so yeah. if you're going to do business in ukraine at the fall of the soviet union you had to work through some leaders putin shows up and as i see it you know it's just hey let's elevate organized crime into the government and run this place so putin's always going to get his cut so if you're going to do business everybody's got to know putin you know, Jeff Bezos knows Putin. Elon Musk knows Putin because they had to do business. They want to do business. You're going to have to know the man. You know, it's it's mob style governance. It's it's mafioso, you know, as a president. But, you know, it's if we don't and I'll, I'll go, we got to go back to step zero of our planning processes and we got to <laughs> figure out a way to account for this, you know, mm -hmm. because you can't have a Zarif on the targeting list. By right. the way, you get rid of him, you're going to destabilize the whole area. Yeah. And you're not just yeah. going to destabilize the whole area. <laughs> yeah. Like the Taliban are going to, like, w w we're going to get ourselves killed. You know, that is such a powerful thing that you just said there. You know, that, that we'll say Ukrainian mm -hmm. person who comes up you know, and was whatever, he was selling jeans or Bruce Springsteen tapes in a Russian subway, you know, or a Soviet subway. And he ends up working in Turkmenistan. He makes a deal there and he has a company there and he has a company and he builds an empire, right? And he is extra legal because that is how that, that's the only way to do it, right? Because there is no state to, to work within. The laws could have been unclear. Yeah, he could have been it's working it. He could have been working in the gray area because, yeah. you know, governments yeah. don't always make the best laws. They're not always transparent. You and know? he's built trust. He's used relationships. He saved the day. He, you know, he's been the person and he feels beholden to these people as much as they are to him. If you rip that person out, like you just mentioned, the person that comes in next, he didn't give a fuck about anybody else. Yeah. Well, and what you might also do is you might take down a hometown hero. <laughs> and now the local population 
doesn't like you even more, oh boy. you know, than they, than before. And yeah. they might be even more prone to powerful, engage in corrupt acts after you've like, look, you, you've taken down our guy, you mm -hmm. know, and we, and we know it was you, you know, let's yeah. say maybe it's the department of justice who yeah. brings down a businessman or enact sanctions against someone. Yeah. Right? That's the hero of Sheboygan. You just took out the hero of Sheboygan. That's not a bad guy. We have a statue to that guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and here's <laughs> here's the thing: like, we could go back to Zarif because I mean, you and I have written on this, and in fact, yeah. that that reminds me, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta throw another narrative about him in the paper I'm working on for the upcoming Air Forces Culture Conference. But you take that guy out, I mean, you people loved him. <laughs> yeah. You know, like his people loved him. He wasn't even from the area, if I remember correctly, but he knew the people. He was of the people, you know, and they respected him mm. because he had that extra layer of religious authority. You know, right. in the business world, it may not be religious authority, but hey, you're the guy who pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. Man, you're a role model. You know, did yeah. you have to? Maybe you had to pay off some warlords so you can move a truck across a road. I don't think does that make you corrupt? Does that make you a savvy business person? Yeah. You know, one man's gift is another man's bribe. You know, that's that is such a strong point because you know, Zarif would communicate with notes, you know, and some kid coming through, hey, where are you going to? You going there? Okay, here, take this note to this guy, you know, and then it would be, and you you pointed this out with your background, with your earlier work before the PhD. That's a holy man. Saying, hey, I need to talk to Bob. He'd write a note. The kid would take it out, and the note would get to Bob, and Bob would show up. He had command over that area yeah. because – not because he was governor, you know, partly, but mostly because the holy man just spoke out and said, I need to see you. And what we realized was when the Afghans were left to their own devices and made big decisions, there was always a holy man there. And that holy man was usually the holy man above Zarif. Mm -hmm. So even he was like, I got to have someone here who's a, you know, who's a boss in the holy world. Yeah. before we get this thing done. And if you're on the business side of things, since we're talking about business in Ukraine, you know, if you need to get a load through, you come to that business manager, like, hey, I got to get a load to this area. Who do I got to talk to? Like, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. You know, because these guys have that network. They have that trust. They have those relationships. And to get things done, that's how they do it. We may not like that here, but if someone from there came here and they said, hey, I want to get a load of something from Chicago down to uh, Alabama is like, well, you got to be careful. You don't pay your gas tax each state yeah. through. You have to fill up in every state with yeah. your big rig. The government will all come after you. So yeah. here's how you do it. And yeah. we would explain the same process. Pay your tolls. Ours looks different. Yeah, absolutely. Pay your tolls. Yeah. Toll. And you cannot avoid them. That's right. If that way station says that's open, you have to stop there and you have yeah. to pay. You have to have your input. No, you, ha you cannot over. And we would explain our process and it would seem cumbersome, burdensome, and stupid, yeah. and they but, would want to avoid it. <laughs> but we've also got more of a functioning state that right. levies ta that has the ability to raise revenues through taxation, yeah. you know, and also put up a stop sign and say, you have to stop at that stop yeah. sign, or we're going to extract another fine from you. Exactly. Another yeah. form of taxation, you know. Now, as I see it, too, in the post-Soviet space, like the political science and scientist in me says, how many businesses, how many like civic groups were operating in the absence of law, in the mm -hmm. absence of a state? See, the state's supposed to provide security, you know. Right. We got Alabama state troopers. We don't have enough of them, in my opinion. You know, these state troopers, we're a very rural state here in Alabama. These state troopers have, each state trooper has like hundreds of miles of highway, yeah. right? That they yeah. can't possibly, and this is a public safety thing, you know? So anytime I hear like, oh, there's a budget crunch, we're going to not have as many state troopers. I'm like, that is crazy. But <laughs> we also have... A, a, a government that functions a little bit, I, I hesitate to say better, but functions. Yeah. We have a functioning state. In the absence of, you know, Soviet control, now all of a sudden you've got all these satellite countries that have to go at it on their own, you know. So who's providing safety and security, but also who's extracting taxes from business, from individuals, 
just to keep the state functioning because the state yeah. doesn't function without resources. So my guess is you probably got more than one business person, especially in Ukraine, who had to exist in the absence of the yeah. rule of law, it had to exist yeah. in the absence of, you know, we like to talk about free markets and capitalism, but look, every government controls its economy some way, shape, or form. All economies are mixed. Okay. Hate to tell you this out there. There's no, there's no pure, there are no pure forms of an economy. No. In fact, there might be a more pure form of an economy that we left behind in Afghanistan because now they're back to bartering. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> how do people, how do individuals exist in interpersonal mm. relationships, but how do businesses exist yeah. in the yeah. absence of a state or in the absence of a functioning state? Because one yeah. thing the state's supposed to do is provide security, but then it also has to manage the welfare of its population. You know, then that's more of a developmental definition of the state and what the state is. But, you know, how many Ukrainian businessmen were just operating not just trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but maybe they're trying to like, they already have successful businesses. They're trying to keep them successful. Right. And all of right. a sudden your government has collapsed. So what are the elements that are going to rise to the top to sure. kind of manage, you know, the functioning of society, you know, yeah. or if a need shows up or someone entrepreneurial says, I can get my hands on X, Yeah. you know, this much of this, that, that, you know, there's this thing, but you've got to enter into an unknown space. You know, you got to go to, oh, I don't know, uh, Kyrgyzstan, because there's this unused raw material or this this thing. And you like, can you help me create a deal? Yeah, I think I can. You know, you need an entrepreneurial person. You also need someone that has the connections to close that loop. Mm -hmm. And when there's not enough things out there you know you come across these things when you because you're a person who can do that and this is like the classic thomas soul middleman right like oh we hate that person but who else would do it and yes you make money when you're a middleman when you can stick your neck out and you can close a deal we we tend to not like that person but they're everywhere because there's opportunities to like if you're a sheep herder and you know you can sell 50 sheep you never raise 200 but if that person comes along, like, can you raise 200 sheep? Yeah, I can raise them, but no one's going to buy 200 sheep. Like, I'll sell them. Can you raise 1,000? I can raise as many as you want. All right, I want you to raise 2,000. All right, then I do. And then all of a sudden, that person becomes much more profitable because someone else can sell the sheep because they're busy raising sheep. That's their job. And so those middlemen, they uh, they get characterized very negatively. And so Soul's work on that stuff is, is brilliant. And you see the rise of these people that do well but they're typically because we can't account for how they do it. And yet there they are, you know, and, and uh, it's almost a universal truth throughout humanity that these folks that fill these gaps, that take these chances, that go do things that no one else wants to do. They, over time, they do really well. If I was, and I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm thinking about how to like, how to research this problem, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think you could get a lot of traction. You could learn a lot if you could, you, did, you wouldn't even have to go back in time, but I would, I would do like some interpersonal interviews with Ukrainian business people. And I would have maybe a standard template of questions to ask them, but I would ask them open-ended questions and ask them like, I, I would want to know, like, were you operating? Were you doing like business as usual? Okay. Soviet union collapses. Then what happens? Right. So in the absence of laws or if the law is unclear like there's going to there's still a culture of business that develops right so i would i would like to know if if i had like one question that i could ask of a random sample of ukrainian business persons i would ask them has the law has have laws or i would want them to talk about how laws that govern their domain of operations their businesses have they changed have they changed? How have they changed? But also, like, I could see a situation where business people are operating in the absence of law. And then all of a sudden a law comes along and like, well, wait a minute, you change, you've changed the way we do business. Maybe nothing illegal was happening anyway. You know, well, it couldn't be anything illegal because there were no laws or the law was unclear. Or here's another one that kind of throws me for a loop. Maybe it was one of those laws that aren't really ever prosecuted. Mm -hmm. So we're just doing business. 
you know? Yeah. So yeah. I would like to know how many people got caught up in, no, we're doing business one way and now the yeah. law changes because it takes time for business to not all businesses aren't always trying to break the law that causes them trouble, you know, yeah. legal trouble, right? Yeah. Department of justice comes down and knocks on your door and, and you don't want that at, you know, business yeah. headquarters, but how long does it take business to catch up to the law? You see, I guess that would be, that would be yeah. one of, one of my talking yeah. points, like what it, regardless of what the business is, you know, like, Hey, a new law yeah. passed. Like, how do you, how do you catch up to that? You can't just flip a switch and like, you know, all of a sudden change the way your manufacturing processes work. Maybe you can, you know, I don't, I'm not a business person. So yeah, clearly it strikes me. It's it's interesting too when I think about all this stuff and and when we come in and try to do this reconstruction and again when we assess these people in Ukraine and these these successful business people, I bet I know I know, I know people. If you spent the last several decades surviving, thriving, making money by using business as your main tool to solve problems. I bet that's your default for solving problems. You know, like it sounds ridiculous to say that, but to prevent this war, to 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 patch up things, you're like, hey, let's make a deal. Let's bring so and so in on a deal. That'll make them less crabby. Um, to include Putin, like, hey, can we just yeah. prevent war by just like, let's go make a deal and let's cut Putin in and chill him the fuck out a little bit. You know, like that. All of this stuff. Like, if we and look. This is globalism, right? Like, can we just be so interconnected with business? This is look, Trump's trying to tried to do this with the Middle East. Like, can we tie businesses to, to Israel and just mellow all of it, the Middle East out? Um, that's what Netanyahu's saying. He's like, let's all just go make a bunch of money on technology, Middle East. That's chill, right? And so when you look at Ukraine and Russia and all the partners around there, you know, these business people are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to say, let's all go out. Let's use energy, let's use agriculture, let's use technology, and let's all, you know, be connected so that we don't have these stupid fights. But if you want that to be a negative thing, and you want to say, look at them doing deals with Russia, dirty, dark Russia, and Bella Russia, you know, you can make them be bad guys. But in reality, that's how they solve problems. These are business people. Yeah, and you run the risk of alienating not just not just the business owner or the business facilitator, but businesses employ people and right. at the end of the day you need a society to support you know the government that lasts once they repel the russian invasion the the government that changes you need people you need people in society to support that and those yeah. people are generally workers not all of us are you know entrepreneurs and business owners you know so you risk alienating the very population that you're intending to mm. intending to help you know yeah i mean let's go back to the female engagement thing that you oh, and i boy. spent some time on we alienated some of the same like some of these same women that yeah. we claim to be we're, we're going to empower them you know yeah. like we we alienated them with our programs that thrust them into the spotlight immediately in ways that they didn't, they didn't want, you know? Yeah. So all of a sudden, like, we're, Hey, let us know if you can, you know, get this survey of women. I'm like, no, I'm not even gonna, no. Yeah. I'm, how many, I'm, how many women did we get killed, maimed, beat up? Yeah. You know, the oh acid God. in the face thing, you know, come on yeah. people, you know? Yeah. And Oh, by the way, the Taliban aren't shooting at me cause I'm not being a dick. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to uh, keep not being a dick, and, <laughs> you know, so how, let's, let me try that, you yeah. know, but we, you know, we run the risk of, I guess, losing the audience, you know, depending on now, like sometimes you're going to have to prosecute somebody, somebody's yeah. doing things wrong, you know, at like child labor, human trafficking, you know, like there's just some, environmental standards there's health and safety that's got to be taken care of and there's some clear-cut laws but listen you know if you just go out and label everybody a putin acolyte well mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to do any business there and yeah. you're essentially going to be taking in the case of ukraine you're going to be trying to take a step forward you're going to be taking 10 steps back yeah, you know, yeah. without fully comprehending you know 
and I'll go back and use that that word culture. You got to understand yeah. the culture and their cultural uh-huh. differences, not just between us and them, but oh, even man. within that country. And as I, I was trying, I was I was I might have mentioned earlier, there's even cultural differences within industries. They're, they're, they're different ways of being and ways of belonging that you got to account for if you want to do things the right way. And yeah. I'm going to say I'm going to go back to fall on one of one of you and I statements. It's let's do less harm. Yeah. You can't you can't do no harm. Right. That's impossible. There's already a war. Right. We're already there. But can we do can we figure out how to do less harm? Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah, takes like- a healthy amount of cultural knowledge, but also appreciation for those differences and a willingness to figure out those nuances. Right. You got to be willing to go learn. You got to be willing to go back to stage zero and maybe recalibrate some of Mm -hmm. the assumptions that went into your planning before you got to stage one. Yeah. You got to be willing to let Pete and Rich go out and go, hey, man, this ain't right. Yeah. You uh, you just fired Dave. You stole his company from him. And you know what Dave did 10 years earlier? He and this town, they uh, they they fixed this miracle thing. You know, they did this. They and he said, no matter open. what, yeah, you know? no matter what, these schools will always stay yeah. open. And we it's have your a library town. Because of this guy. Yeah. You know? We did this together and it'll never change. And you guys just changed it. You guys just broke the contract. Yeah. And they're pissed about that. And they're never going to forgive you. Uh, this reminds me of the time in Iraq when um, we had like the general, the Iraqi general, like you're the boss. This is all your territory. And so the Iraqi general came over to the American camp and the Americans are like, yeah, you can't come on this camp right now. You know, sure. You're the senior commander in this area, but you're going to have to wait outside the camp. And they sweated that dude out for hours and he was pissed and he didn't forgive a commander for the next three or four commanders until we left that area. Yeah. Never forgave us. He right. Should. He shouldn't. And we, and I told every commander like this dude's going to be pissed at you and he's not going to be as cooperative as you want him to be. You might think he's happy, but he's holding something over your head. And I'll tell you what it is. And so these guys would all try to roll out the red carpet. He was still mad and there was no fix in it. I didn't, yeah. we didn't ever figure out how to fix it. And so these kind of things, these are these nuggets that you have to have a Pete and a rich to go, listen, listen to me. There's a problem here. You got to go fix that community. You better bring Dave with you because Dave is the one that knows these guys. And you better say, you know, we fucked up. We're sorry about this. We didn't mean to fuck with Dave. We didn't know. Yeah. And you got to make right because if you don't, it's going to be impossible to fix. Yeah. Once it's, you lose, once you violate trust, you know, especially yeah. if you, it's disrespect is hard to come back yeah. from. Oh, you man. Know? And it's really like, in interpersonal relationships, it's hard, but when it's yeah. done by governments to people, you know, uh-huh. those governments lose legitimacy and governments that aren't legitimate in the minds of their people. You know, this is one reason why Afghanistan did not work the way we wanted yeah. to, because we yeah. never really bothered to, Oh, we, we had a legitimate government on paper, yeah. but you know, you and I go on a patrol right across the street from the district center oh, we boy. Go a few miles out. And it's like, Hey, you know, what do you think about the government? Like, I don't think about the government. The government yeah. doesn't work. In fact, district governor still owes me money because he took some of my goats for a party and never paid me. Yeah. You know, well, why don't you guys use the courts? Because if I use the court, my, my son's going to disappear and be in jail for nine months. <laughs> so I go to the Taliban we got this thing called Sharia law. Perhaps you've yeah. heard of it. And the Perhaps. Taliban judge gives us a swift decision with the authority of God. Oh, and man. we abide by that every yeah. time. So what do you mean, Jairoa? You know, what, what's this? That? I got to I got to tell this story because everybody needs mm-hmm. to hear this. So so Rich and I were tasked to figure out some things about rule of law, which, by the way, the American rule of law guy was not all that comfortable with. But he was privy to all our reports. And we went and talked to the judge. The judge's not the point of this story, but one of the things about him was, is like, why is he not uh, getting cases to hear? <laughs> and so first he's like, I would love to hear cases. I don't know how your guys' court works, but judges in our court, we don't go get cases. They're brought before us. And we're like, Ooh, great point. Yeah. He's like, by the way, I still don't have my furniture. I have an empty room. I sit over there. Third, uh, I'm terrified of these people. I'm not from around here. The rule of law American guy said he was going to get me a gun. I'm yeah. still waiting for that. Yeah. I'm going on vacation and the other judges coming in. You guys let me know what you find out. So that's part one of the story. 
Part two is Rich and I go across to the other district, the center of the capital. So this is the most populous district mm -hmm. we leave and go to the capital. And we're going to go look more into rule of law and try to find out why the, the top cop and, and, you know, the prosecutor aren't bringing cases. We get to the chief of police's office and outside his door for all the way down the wall are dads waiting to go see the boss to find out about their kid and how they could get him out of trouble. So yeah. court was happening every day. It just court. didn't involve that judge. No. The rule of law guy was not happy about that. Because <laughs> no. it's this is the system we gave you and you're not using it. No, yeah. they were they had in, they had integrated their old system, which was very informal. Yeah, you know, they integrated that into the you know, dated. Yeah. In fact, they never changed, you know, but yeah. they they and in fact, had we let them integrate their way into, you know, our way of doing things, it might have worked better. But one problem that we have, you know, that we had in Afghanistan is there's no swift justice in the Jiroa system. Well, because there's processes, there's procedures. You got to collect the evidence. You got to, you know, show the evidence to the other side. You have to get lawyers involved. And they're like, we don't, we don't do any of that. Yeah. You know, we go find We're send this off to the crime lab and everybody's like, yeah. What yeah. Are you what crime? I, what, if what are you I ever took the time to do it and went to the crime lab, I could say, how many times do you guys send cases out to a court and how many times are there convictions? Mm -hmm. And that number is going to be somewhere around zero. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't, I didn't <laughs> just pull the nine months number, you know, out of thin air. Like that was the, that was the wait time at yeah. least nine months. But why do that when you can go to the Taliban? They'll, they'll have you an answer in less than nine hours. Yeah. And I wasn't kidding about the thing. They'll handle a murder right there in house. They'll handle yeah. it. And they all know what to expect. Mm -hmm. They deal with it. And there's money exchanged. And, that's, and they handle it in what they call civil court. You know, that's what they do. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I wanted to bring in, and just because uh, it's important that we um, understand the failure of our most educated people. You and I have both seen this. We use State Department send people out, you know, the Kennedy School of Graduate Kid who's got a master's degree and they send him far afield and he goes to talk to a governor and I rolls a governor. You know, this is this is a guy who has a gun on his hip and he's glad to dot you in the eye if he disagrees with you. You know, just because you have a degree, I'm talking directly to you in the audience. If you think you know what you're doing, you don't. And if you think you understand what it's like to be a Ukrainian elder or a, a farmer or anything else, shut up and listen because you don't understand what it means to be these people. I'll let Rich talk about this, but the respect you have to have, the, if you think you know what's going on, stop. You're making the first, first and second mistake. You are destabilizing and you don't realize you're making the mistake. And so that's these are the first two mistakes. Yeah, I would just add there's going to be a bunch of – you know, collateral damage, you know, if you make the wrong move and chances are you're going to make the wrong move, you know? So, you know, a really wise person once told me, I never learned anything while talking. Mm. And, you know, he was, he was telling me to shut up and listen is what he was <laughs> doing, you know, and I've since, you know, tried to do that, but you can have all of your degrees, but you can't, I mean, I don't know if you can have a degree in experience, mm. you know, I don't know if they offer that anywhere. You know, you have to go again. We use the phrase boots on the ground and it means something different, you know, to you and me probably than it does to, you know, other people out there that have never had their boots on the ground. But you got to have that on the ground perspective and it doesn't come easily. You're not going to get it overnight, you know, but you got to listen. And you got to pay attention and you also have to take, take your academic ideas and just put them in the abstract for the most part. You know, I'm not saying they're not valuable, but right. then go and see, and then see how what's happening on the ground. How does it match with your theoretical or philosophical understanding? Or I will even go so far as to say your policy level understanding, right? Go and get some experience, but also, you know, and, and, particular I'm talking to the DOD here don't just rely on what the guy before you <laughs> said about the situation you know especially if the guy before you you know pissed off the commanding general of the area you know or if the guy before you you know 
never really bothered to test some of those assumptions in those intelligence reports, yeah. you know, because if you never leave the two shop, you're only going to get what's fed into the two shop. And the, it often, maybe you can't go make your own observations, but you got to have people who are willing to get their hands dirty or at least go watch other people get their hands dirty. Because yeah. I'm not going to, I'm going to use my air quotes, I'm not going to bribe Mr. Warlord so I can go over his road, but I will give him his gift, you know. But maybe you can sit in the back of the truck and watch how it happens. And then you can report that back. Right. Because Mr. Warlord may not be a bad guy. Mr. Warlord might actually be your best eyes and ears on the ground if you get to know him. You know, yeah. Mr. Warlord might actually respect that district governor also because he understands that district governor is a religious elder. And that is more than just the cherry on top in Afghanistan. And to a great extent, from what I've learned, Iraq, that's more than just the cherry on top. You know, it's the whole damn cake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I've had you for about an hour and a half, man. And it's been awesome. Some of that stuff was really incredible. And, uh, well, I hope somebody's listening and I hope it helps bring some, yeah. clarity. like if anything demonstrates the complexity of this, this, if you're going to have a kind of conversation about corruption, you better be ready for at least an hour and a half, at least if you're talking yeah. to me, yeah. you know, but you got to be ready to challenge your own assumptions and you got to be ready to learn something. Yeah. You know, and it is complex. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about corruption, you know, I often I often say, like, look, we are the corruption, you know, and people reject this. And this is like the first thing, like if we can't start with we are part of the problem, we are the instability, then then we can't even begin to fix it. I, I think of uh, you're going to someone who has to use a well to drink water. And that well is the corruption. They go down there, and, and if we didn't provide that well of corruption, they wouldn't fill their bucket with it. They would do something else. Yeah. And so when you bring $500 million to a party, people <laughs> are going to want it. <laughs> They're going to do anything to include killing people to get it. Bags so, and bags of money. Literally, oh, my God. Bags of money. $500,000, please build a park, and we won't hold you accountable if you don't do it. Okay. Thanks yeah. for the $500,000. See you later. And I'll you, be back next month for the next park project. I've got a great location. It yeah. looks exactly the same as the other, you know? Yep. So we are the corruption until we change that. And we're going to be the corruption in the Ukraine. So uh, that, those are my final parting words. What do you want to say in closing, Rich? Oh, I just want to say thanks for having me on. It's been a while, but this is something that, you know, I've, I've done some research previously specifically on corruption, but you know, I've got school starts for me in about a week and a half. So I'm, I'm actually still prepping one of my classes, uh, a foundations of political science class, and we got a section on corruption. So this is going to help support some of that, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk, not just with you, but with the audience about this thing, because, you know, I do, um, I do hope for the best for the Ukrainian people. I commented to one of my colleagues a few weeks ago that if I was younger um, and I had no ties to family and friends back here, I might have picked up arms and I might be, you know, I might be playing in the dirt over there helping the Ukrainians. Maybe. Well, I'm yeah. glad you're old and you have a family <laughs> and friends and you didn't go do that shit. We got, we need you here, man. You've done yeah. enough. Knock that shit off. All right, let me no, roll this. This is, this, yeah. is, this is good stuff. I appreciate it. And like I said to the audience, if you guys are interested in some of the things I wrote, my papers on corruption are very easy to understand. They use the United States, they use states as the units of analysis, but you should have no problems finding that stuff if you want to reach out. I'm um, easy to find on email. And like I said, I'll say it again. These were my own words and thoughts, not the words and thoughts of anyone from my organization. Go Trojans. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here, are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you 